ಮುದಚ್ಯತಿ ಪೂರ್ಣಸ್ಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಾದಾಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮೇವಾವಶಿಷ್ಯತಿ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ದ ಇನ್ವಿಸಿಬಲ್ ಈಸ್ ದ ಇನ್ಫಿನಿಟ್ ದ ವಿಸಿಬಲ್ ಟೂ ಈಸ್ ದ ಇನ್ಫಿನಿಟ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ಇನ್ಫಿನಿಟ್ ದ ವಿಸಿಬಲ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಇನ್ಫಿನಿಟ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಟೆನ್ಷನ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಕಮ್ ಔಟ್ ದ ಇನ್ಫಿನಿಟ್ ರಿಮೈನ್ಸ್ ದ ಸೇಮ್ ಈವನ್ ಡೋ ದ ಇನ್ಫಿನಿಟ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಕಮ್ ಔಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಓಂ ಫೀಸ್ 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 so last in the last class we were trying to deal with the first two verses of this upanishad the first verse tells us that the creation is one the reality is one the existence is one and the entire world assets is pervaded by the divine spirit now here a question a metaphysical question arises in advaita philosophy the very important question if the world is non different from god or atman or the absolute reality then why do we see this world changing moving coming to existence existing for some time and then vanishing everything in this world is moving so how do we explain this vedantins give a very important reply the world is real as the atman behind it it is unreal as world i shall explain this in the light of a well known simile in vedanta that makes things very clear in vedanta it is called rajju sarpa bhranti the imagery of a rope and a snake now you remember this imagery is as old as second or first century ad even in the ancient metaphysical works of nagarjuna which was perhaps written madhyamika kariga vigraha vyavartani these are some of the important uh, metaphysical works which belong to the shunyavada it's called the theory of voidness of the buddhist these works were written around first or second century ad or the first century bc around this period the imagery is this just think of a room which is dimly light you can see something something is lying there something in the shape of a snake but actually it's a piece of rope now when you bring light or when you uh, when, when you illumine the room you understand immediately that it is not a snake it is only a piece of rope now that object is real as rope and unreal as snake what we mistook as snake in dim light was in fact rope only it's not that the rope has come into existence or the snake has vanished the snake never vanished because to begin with it did not exist and the rope is not the creation of light even if you don't bring light even if the room is in pitch darkness the rope will remain the rope now the object that we see in dim light is real as rope and unreal as snake similarly this whole world existence this universe is unreal as universe but real as brahman 
when you superimpose the characteristics of the changing world on the unchanging reality, that's Brahman, then we visualize the universe. But the moment we see the, rea that the, the reality behind the unreal world is Brahman itself, then there is no such thing as Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. Then the experience tells us that Brahma Satyam Jagat Satyam. This is the point. So that's why in philosophy we say Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. Brahman is the only reality. Jagat as Jagat is unreal. But Jagat as Brahman behind it is real. In fact, that is the experience of Turiya Nandaji. Towards the end of his life, he experienced Brahma Satyam, Jagat Satyam. This is not Tuliyanandaji's contribution. This is already stated in Shankaracharya's commentary very clearly. That is, Surupa, Rupa, Surupa Drishtya Satyam, Nama Rupa Drishtya Mithya. This is the Shankaracharya statement. Anyhow, I will come to that subject. Now, if the entire creation is pervaded by the Divine Spirit, Isha Vasyam, it is, if it is pervaded by the absolute reality, then what is the status of Jagat? The Jagat also is in fact non-different from Brahman. Therefore, the Jagat is not something to be enjoyed, but something to be enjoyed through the medium of renunciation. In other words, live in this world, work in this world, Make the best of this world, but keep in mind that Isha Vasip, this Jagat is pervaded by the Divine Spirit. Then we will not be enslaved by this world. In fact, that is the scheme of metaphysical current in Isha Vasya Upanishad. Isha Vasya Upanishad tells you at the beginning that the entire creation is pervaded by the Divine Spirit. But then it doesn't tell us to run away from the world. It tells us to live in this world, make the best of this world. But at the same time, keep in mind the supreme truth that this world, as world is unreal, but this world as Isha, as God, as Brahman is real. Now, then slowly the Upanishad takes us to the higher level of Philosophical speculation. This, the, the higher level of philosophical speculation is directly dealt with in the sixth and seventh mantras. I would not come to that at this stage, but I shall refer to that. Then only we will get an idea of the road map, the root map of philosophical speculation in the Isha Vasya Upanishad. See, if you look at the sixth and seventh mantra. It tells us the attitude of a man of wisdom who has realized the fact that the world that we live in is pervaded by the Divine Spirit. Yastu sarvani bhutani atmani eva anupasyati sarva bhudeshu cha atmanam tato na vijugupsade. This is the sixth mantra. I should explain this. Seventh mantra tells us, Yasmin sarvani bhūdāni ātmai vā bhūd vijānataha tatrakko moha kasyoka ekattum anupasyataha. These are the two famous mantras which tells us how a man of supreme wisdom who has realized the spiritual unity of existence looks upon the world, looks upon himself and looks upon uh, the whole creation. After giving a brief description of the Supreme Atman in the fourth and fifth mantras, the Upanishad tells us in the sixth and seventh mantra how a man of supreme wisdom, a man of spiritual realization, not a man of philosophical conviction, that should be understood. Here, the Upanishad is not describing the attitude of a man of philosophical conviction. It is explaining the attitude of 
a man of spiritual experience who has experienced the unity and who is every moment experiencing the unity of himself with the entire creation. Sixth mantra says, Yaha tu sarvani bhutani atmani anupasyati sarvabhudeshu atmanam cha anupasyati saha tataha na vijugupsade. The literal meaning is this. One who experiences the existence of Sarvani Bhudani, everything in this world, in himself, and who experiences the presence of himself in every living being. That person doesn't hate anyone. He doesn't see anybody as alien to himself, as different or distinct from himself. He cannot hate anyone. He cannot blame anyone because he doesn't see anything or anybody other than himself. In fact, this mantra is very important from the standpoint of practical Vedanta. In fact, in Swamiji, in his practical Vedanta, makes a very memorable, unforgettable statement. The infinite oneness is the eternal sanction of all morality, all ethics, all good actions. Swamiji says, Advaita experience is the only ultimate um, touchstone, ultimate criterion of ethics and morality. God cannot enforce ethics and morality. Policemen may be able to do that, but God cannot. If God tells you, I will take you to hell if you do something wrong, and if you reply, well, I don't care if I go to hell, what will God do? God will be helpless. Policemen can threaten you, but I will take you to jail, I will imprison you, and you may be frightened. But, you, but God will be helpless. If you tell God, well, you, I'm ready to go to hell, you take me to hell, I don't ma mind. I, I shall rope, I shall kill, I shall do something wrong, I shall commit sin, I don't care if you take me to hell. What will God do? God will be absolutely helpless. So, Advaita philosophy takes ethical philosophy to a higher level. It says, you don't in injure your neighbor, you love your neighbor, you don't hate your neighbor, you don't commit crime, not because you are afraid of a God who will take you to hell, but rather by injuring your neighbor, you are injuring yourself. By hurting your neighbor, you are hurting yourself. Because your neighbor and yourself are not two different entities. Your neighbor is non-distinct and non-different from yourself. This is the essence of Advaitic concept of the spiritual unity of creation. So such a person, Tato Navijugupsade, he doesn't hate anyone. He doesn't look down upon anyone. So this is from the ethical point of view. The seventh mantra, you should remember, I'm just giving you a road map of the the the, the evolution of philosophy in Isavasya Upanishad in the light of Shankara's philosophy. So if I take one sloga after another, it may not, I can, I shall come back to the earlier sloga, third and fourth sloga, I shall come back. But before that, I just want to give you an idea of the, of the uh, uh, steady evolution of metaphysical thought in Isavasya Upanishad. So the sixth mantra uh, uh, explains what Swamiji means when he says that infinite oneness is the eternal sanction of all morality, all ethics, all good actions. Advaita alone can be a permanent uh, foundation for ethical philosophy or moral philosophy. Because it, it's, not, it's not based on, based upon a God who punishes you, a God whom you should be afraid of, or who, a God who may take, drive you to hell. But rather it is based on the philosophy that the reality is one, creation is one. You can't do injury to anyone, not because you are afraid of the, uh, of, of the punishment of God, but rather you, by injuring yourself, you are uh, injuring. By injuring your neighbor, you are injuring yourself. By hurting your neighbor, you are hurting yourself. Now the seventh mantra tells, this means sarvani bhutani, Atmai Vabhud Vijayanataha Tatrakko Moha Kashoka Ekatum Anupasyataka. 
ekattu manupashyataha this is a very important point the one who experiences pashyati literally means uh, uh, you know, seeing but pashyati that word actually the original root is drish dhadu and drish dhadu is the foundation of the the word in sanskrit darshana darshana means not seeing but experiencing so ekattu manupashyata means a person who experiences ekattu ekattu means uh, unity uh, a spiritual unity of the whole creation that one who experiences his uh, non distinction non difference uh, from the rest of creation yasmin sarvani bhutani atmai va bhut vijanatah the mantra is this yasmin vijanatah sarvani bhutani atma eva abhut tatra ekattum anupasyatah ka mokah ka shloka shokah this is the question this is the, in fact is some kind of a question the end of the at the end of the mantra the mantra concludes with a question a man of wisdom a man who has realized his unity and who is every moment experiencing his unity with the rest of creation how how can such a man of wisdom uh, have any grief any sorrow how can he be sorry about anything how can he have any feeling of grief that means he will be beyond grief sorrow all worries because every moment he is enjoying the bliss of his unity with the entire creation now these two shlokas these two verses describe the experience of a man who has reached the supreme wisdom now how can how what does how does the upanishad uh, take uh, ordinary take an ordinary man to this stage of spiritual experience that's the next question here we have to come to some of the fundamental principles of hindu social life and in hindu society we 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 have the concept of purushartha means four fundamental values of life in sanskrit we call dharma artha kama and moksha dharma means let us say righteousness moksha means liberation moksha is a transcendental value dharma is that fundamental value which should guide our activities while living in this world in all our worldly pursuits when we work hard when we pursue the path of worldly prosperity status money worldly prosperity enjoyments all this when we strive to acquire wealth and enjoy this world our action should be guided by certain values these values are collectively called dharma in fact that there again the word comes from a root root the dhril means which is that which bears we supports this dharma this philosophy of righteousness supports it the basis the foundation of all our activities all our activities related to worldly life that should be understood very clearly not necessarily our spiritual pursuit when a man works hard to make money to build a house to do business to teach in a college or to plow in a field whatever may be his profession or engineer or doctor anybody all his activities should be guided by certain fundamental values which are collectively called dharma or righteousness no according to hindu philosophy upanishadic philosophy if a man uh, holds fast to these fundamental values right values of righteousness and tries to enjoy this world try to live in this world a time comes when he realizes the transitoriness the perishable nature of worldly enjoyments and then he asks the question what lies beyond 
is there something more than money, more than wealth, more than status? Is there something which is imperishable, something beyond empirical? This inquiry comes. But this is possible only if, a, if an individual um, holds fast to certain fundamental principles of righteousness. If he uh, deviates from these fundamental values, then he will become a slave of uh, worldly pursuits. He may become a machine, he may become a madman, or he may become a demon. These are three possibilities. He may lead just a mechanical life, or he may, he may lose his spirit, his soul, but he may acquire everything else in this world. Or he may become a demon. So, dharma is the fundamental principle based on which a person can follow the path of artha and karma. Artha means, artha actually means something that we, that we need to, for, to acquire from something. So money, wealth, all these are things which a man needs to live in this world. Man, these are necessary things. These are the instruments, the tools which a man needs, but these are not, they should not become his masters. His instrument should not become his master. His instrument should remain his instrument. So, artha, wealth, and other necessary tools, and then other desires, which, uh, which every uh, normal man living in this world will have. Artha and Kama, these two. So, he is allowed, Hindu philosophy doesn't ask a man to run away from the world. It, per it, give, it permits him to live in this world, enjoy this world, but he should uh, he should not deviate from the path of the fundamental values, which are collectively called dharma. Now, when he leads a virtuous life, righteous life, uh, without deviating from the path of righteousness or dharma, he realizes that there is something beyond all this. That's why you find people who have worked very hard to make a lot of money, successful businessmen, captains of industry, big scientists, who have made billions of dollars, uh, then after some time they start uh, donating huge amounts to philanthropic organizations and they start spending money for, uh, uh, for righteous pursuits. Right? It at least to get a peace of mind because at least the, the, most, the most immediate need may be little peace of mind. For that they start uh, donating money, helping charitable organizations and philanthropical societies. Because slowly they realize, well, there is something beyond money. There is something which money cannot bring, which status cannot bring. And then they uh, start thinking of something beyond. They are not at seekers of moksha or the uh, liberation, what is called, that's, that's the last value, dharma, artha, kama and moksha. But still they, they, they have already started feeling uh, the perishable nature of worldly pleasures. There is something beyond this. And then he slowly evolves the next stage of his, not spiritual life, is life as a whole, that is called moksha or the transcendental value. Now, third mantra tells us that a person who forgets this and who thinks who is under the delusion that money can bring him everything, wealth can bring him everything, he is living in a world of darkness. He enters the world of pitch darkness. That's the literal meaning of the third mantra. The third mantra actually is a kind of warning, a strong warning to those who are under the wrong notion that they can live in this world without following these fundamental ethical and moral values. So, asurya namate lokaha, anthena tamasa avrutaha, tamste pretya abhigachanti, yekecha atmahano janaha. So, before the Upanishad takes 
a man takes the man to the higher transcendental level he gives a strong warning to those who cling fast to matter and material pursuits and it is asurya nama asurya means those places inhabited by evil men actually this is a, you know the upanishad i should say something about upanishad language the upanishad language is sometimes uh, uh, sometimes it is called a kind of occult language it's not occult language so upanishads uh, were written in an age when philosophy was highly evolved but language was still in its stage of infancy that is the explanation given by linguists and philologists so very often this language used in upanishadic literature is sometimes not uh, sometimes indirect so asurya means a place which is normally inhabited by evil men do inhabited by ignorant men and ignorance is symbol of darkness the other way also correct darkness symbolizes ignorance so asuryaha nama te lokaha andhena tamasa avrutaha this is the breakup of the mantra yekech janaha atmahanaha te pretya tan abhigachanti this is the be brief description the meaning is this generally people who are not aware of any of something beyond the per, beyond the perishable beyond the material thing that material pressure is the end of everything that's why if see, we we become slaves of material pressure because we don't know there is something beyond it if a, if a, if a wise man realizes there is something beyond the material then he may live in this world a material life but he will not be enslaved by it but those who are ignorant of the ultimate transcendental goal of man's life cling fast to the material life they become slaves of matter so that's why this mantra says such people when they die pretya abhigachanti tan abhigachanti means lokan abhigachanti that is tamasa avrutan lokan abhigachanti this is the description in the bhashya literature in short those who live in this world under the strong conviction that there is nothing beyond the matter nothing beyond the material pleasure they enter a world of pitch darkness after their death this mantra also gives a begins a glimpse of our the, the evolution of human life you know in our in hindu tradition we believe in two fundamental principles that is one is the theory of rebirth the other is law of karma karma theory doesn't mean that we are slaves or we are just helpless tools in the hands of karma that's not so if the present is the result of past then future can be the result of the present so karma theory doesn't reduce man's life into a helpless repetition of something that we have done in the past rather karma theory properly interpreted tells us that we are the makers of our own destiny in fact this is the essence of swami ji's uh, karma yoga lectures in the beginning that long lectures the series of lectures swami ji drives on this point karma theory and the, the theory of rebirth do not reduce human life into helpless uh, mechanisms it doesn't mean that we are helpless tools in the hands of the mighty karma if our present life is the result of our past karma then we can build a future a better future with the actions at present this is what the karma theory says but this is possible this improvement of future modification of karma is possible only if 
a person, if a man is convinced of the imperishable nature of Atman and the perishable nature of matter. If he is convinced that there is something beyond the perishable, beyond the matter, then he will pursue the path of a transcendental value. And then he will live in this world, but he can work as a master and not as slaves. But this mantra says, those who do not have this discrimination, they enter the world of pitch darkness. So the word uses atmahana means somebody who kills Atman. It means some, somebody who is ignorant of the true nature of Atman. Otherwise it becomes a hen, an endless cycle of life, death, rebirth, again continuation of our activities. Normally we do certain things because our tendency to do that and this tendency is the result of previous actions, in previous life. Through study, through proper thinking, through study of scriptures, we can imbibe noble thoughts and modify our actions and modify our future and improve our future also. Otherwise, it is an endless cycle of life, death and rebirth. But one can come out of this wheel of life, death and rebirth if one understands there is something beyond the perishable matter. And that is the only way to come out of this wheel of karma, wheel of the cyclic uh, progression of life and death. And this, this idea is accepted not only in Hindu philosophy but also in Buddhist philosophy. Only in Buddhist philosophy the concept of an eternal Atman, an unchanging Atman, which is Satchidananda, which is absolute knowledge and bliss and which is the all-pervading spiritual reality, this concept is not found in Buddhist philosophy. But the rebirth, the love rebirth and love karma, these are found in Buddhist philosophy also, not taken from Upanishadic, Vedic literature only. So after giving this strong warning, in the third mantra, the Upanishad next gives a very, very uh, celebrated description of the true nature of Atman. Now, in these two mantra, be before entering the fourth and fifth mantra, I should give an idea of how Upanishad literature normally explains the Atman. Atman, I don't want to use the word soul because the soul very, is very often understood to mean only mind or intellect. But I should... I would rather stick to the word Atman because that word has got a great metaphysical significance, spiritual significance in the Upanishad philosophy. Upanishad tells us that Atman cannot be explained, Atman cannot be described, Atman cannot be defined. And the Upanishad tells us, Atman says, Yato vajo nivartande aprapi manasasaka. Taitiri Upanishad tells to translate in English, mind and words went to describe Atman, went in search of Atman. They could not def describe or define Atman. They, they returned empty-handed. This is what the Upanishads tell us. And sometimes this idea is put in some other language, Vajra Magojara, means Atman cannot be seen. Agojara means that is invisible. It is invisible to words. It can only be experienced. And, you know, anything which can be explained in words will be different from experience. See, Guru Maharaj says in the Gospel, even the sweetness of sugar, you may write a whole book on the sweetness of sugar, but the experience you get by describing or by reading this book will be totally different from the experience of putting one, one spoon full of sugar in your mouth. Totally different. That's the case of even ordinary mundane empirical experiences. The Upanishads tell us the absolute transcendental experience can never be defined. It's what called anirvachaniya, uh, vacha magochara, and so on. But then what are these Upanishads? 
Upanishads are sometimes called Brahma Vidya, in a secondary sense. All, in fact, all the great teachers of Upanishads are unanimous in one point. They say, the entire Vedic literature, the entire Upanishad literature are unsuccessful attempts to explain the inexplicable. But the greatness of Upanishads is this. The Upanishads tell us the reality is beyond us. We cannot explain the Upanishads. Other, some other religious books may tell us that this is God. But the Upanishads tell us God cannot be explained. But then, then what is the benefit of reading Upanishads? By reading Upanishads, we get an idea, an idea of the transcendental nature of the indescribable, inexplicable reality, which can be explained as our own inner experience. But so that's why it is different from the uh, Kantian concept of thing in itself, critical pure reason. Thing in itself is unknown and unknowable. But Upanishad tells us it is unknown in the sense it cannot be pursued by the five senses and it cannot be defined by words. But it is knowable, it can be known as our own inner reality. That is where the Upanishad philosophy depa departs from Kantian, from Kantism, Kantian philosophy, of Kantian metaphysics. Upanishads tell us the reality can be experienced as our own inner essence. And when we get that experience, it is beyond words. That's why in Brihadaranyaka Upanishad there are some celebrated verses. When you reach that level of experience, we go beyond Vedas, we go beyond Upanishads. This here again, Swami Vivekananda trying to explain this subtle metaphysical, philosophical idea of the Upanishad tells us, I want to take the humanity beyond the Bible, the Ved, Gita, and beyond the books. That's what Swamiji means. An experience where none of these religious scriptures exist means the experience which is beyond all these scriptures. Scriptures are necessary to tell us that the reality is beyond scriptures. Now, in fact, last day, during our, in one of our discussion in the Vivekananda Hall, somebody put this question, Mandukya Kariga, Mandukya Upanishad Mantra. Mandukya Upanishad tells us, Na Praknyam, Na Praknyam, Na Bhayada Praknyam, Na Praknyam, and so on. Means, Shantam, Shivam, Madhvedam, Jadurtham, and all this mantra comes there. So the Upanishads, this gives an example. Upanishads normally resort to two types of uh, two types of descriptions while trying to describe the indescribable. Sometimes it tells us Satchidananda. It is the, uh, the the absolute knowledge, bliss, absolute uh, existence, knowledge, and bliss. But this is only an attempt to explain. And along with that, the Vedas, the Upanishads, reminds us that in reality, this anubhuti or experience is beyond all this. So this is one way of explaining. Satchidananda, Surupa Lakshana is sometimes it is called. The absolute existence, knowledge and bliss. Then there is another way of explaining this. There the Upanishad tells us, this is neither the experience in dream state or the experience in waking state or experience in susupti state, neither prajna nor aprajna, like that, go, neither mind nor intellect nor intuition nor thinking, feeling and so on. Now, where uh, the language fails to understand, fails to explain the reality, what is left out? What is left out is the experience. And that experience is beyond description. So to drive home this point that the reality is beyond words, the Upanishad uses words in juxtaposition, either in the absolute Surubha Lakshana method or in the negative method. 
So it says it is neither mind nor intellect nor body, neither long nor short, neither light nor darkness and so on. And no, can there be anything which is neither light nor darkness, neither long nor short, neither intellect nor mind, anything? There can be nothing of that kind in the, in the, in the empirical mountain realm. If there is something beyond all this, it is the only inexplicable, indescribable experience. This is the peculiar technique with the Upanishad sages try to, I mean, they resorted to. In the Vedas also, Nasadiya Sukta, Nasadasi, Nosadasi, Tadani, so another example. In the, in, the, in the beginning, there was neither existence nor non-existence. Now, can there be anything which is neither existence nor non-existence? It means it's beyond words. So words are used in such a way as to drive home the idea that reality is beyond words. That is here, you can find this fourth and fifth mantra, you can get an idea of this. These two mantras, if you read, read together, you will understand this. Anej, anej dekam manaso jeviyaha nainad deva apnuvan purva marshad tad dhavatha anyan atyadi dishthad tasmin napo madarishwa dhathati. Now this Atman, it is faster than mind. Mind is fast, faster than anything else because mind can think, speculate in split seconds. So, mind is the fastest uh, that we can imagine, we can conceive of. And the Upanishad tells us this Atman is beyond mind, it is faster than mind. So, Atma is anejat. First it says anejat means that it doesn't move. And it doesn't move at the same time it's faster than mind. So you can see the apparent contradiction. Now, this, it is contradiction only when we look at it from the empirical point of view. If I say this table is neither table nor non-table, it is absolutely contradictory. Because this, this, is, this is something which I can see and feel, is something purely empirical, within the sensory perception. But what is beyond the sensory perception? What is beyond all this? cannot be explained either, either as moving or non-moving. That's why it is says, you know, this Atman is anejat, it doesn't move. It is one. Even the word one is ekam, the Upanishad language, the word, you see, advaita is word. Advaita means non-dual. Now, why is this non-dual issue? It could be said one why should you say non-dual? It means it is neither non-dual nor one. It cannot be even explained as one. Because the moment you say Advaita, is, Advaita implies one, then it becomes defined. If you define something, it becomes limited. Anything which is within definition is limited. Limit definition means limitation. Explanation means limitation. Description means limitation. We are uh, making a frame with four walls and we are limiting the reality within that when we when we describe explain or define something so to imply that reality is beyond description beyond definition beyond explanation the Upanishad tells Upanishad uses a language which is apparently contradictory but it is not contradictory that is the point to be understood here anejat it doesn't move but then it says, Manasaha Jeviyaha, it is faster than mind. And it is Ekam. And then, Purva Mashat. Purva Mashat means, you see, when mind goes in search of Atman, it finds that Atman has already reached there. That's why it is, Atman is said to be faster than mind. Indriyas also try to Read somewhere and then find Atman has already reached there because Atman is all pervasive, it is omnipresent, it is all pervading. So you cannot say that uh, it didn't exist when you reach there. When you reach there, you understand Atman is already present there because Atman is 
omnipresent, all pervading. So it is unmoving at the same time, it is faster than mind. 